You're listening to Influence America Radio. This is your host, Jordan Rickards. I'm here with Glenn DeLakin of Tandem Radio. Glenn, nice to see you. Good to see you, Jordan. And uh, I'm excited to be here for the show because our goal, as we know, uh, as we know, and we'll share with our audience, uh, is basically to bring two unique perspectives to what's going on in America today and how that impacts us globally uh, and locally um, from uh, a number of different perspectives and especially uh, two fresh looks uh, from you, Jordan, and myself. Right, and you know, it, it should be stated, I think, at the outset that the impetus behind this show, Glenn, is uh, you and I think feel mutually that we're reaching kind of a critical mass mm -hmm. in our country today and, and in the world, but in particular our country. And I have to tell you, in my 35 years in the planet, I don't remember a time when, I've saw, when I saw this much chaos and this much, much dysfunction in our culture uh, and in our government. Now, if you just look at, for example, this past summer, in fact, you can go back a little further to, you know, the Russians annexing Ukraine right. and our foreign mm -hmm. policy failures there. Then, you know, in May, it turns out that, you know, we found out that our immigration department had released uh, 36,000 uh, illegal immigrants back into the community right. who combined had been convicted of 88,000 different crimes, including 193 homicides, 1,000 aggravated assaults, nearly 500 sexual assaults. It was called the, the largest jailbreak in history, right. and it got almost no attention because right on the back of that was the VA scandal. Right. And that was dominating the news for about a week and a half uh, until the president used his uh, executive power uh, to hyper-regulate the energy industry, which mm -hmm. is gonna drive up costs. And that was in the news for about 36 hours until we had the whole thing with that, uh, the hostage we received, right. Bergdahl, where we traded off uh, four terrorists for really what turned out to be a deserter and we did it or I should say the president did it illegally right. you know he had to give Congress 30 days notice and he didn't and he didn't seem to to much care we went from that to the IRS destroying hard drives right. you know so, so as to avoid a congressional investigation and at the back end of all of that because all these things kept getting forgotten about um, we, we're dealing with two competing border crises right now mm. there's the obvious one um, with the, the Central American and then Mexican border, um, with uh, these now 50,000, we think, children coming into the country. And then, of course, the, the perpetual crisis in Israel, which, right. when understood at its most uh, fundamental, is itself a border crisis. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, Israelis um, uh, encamping in, in territory that the Palestinians think is their own. Right. And, uh, but I wanted to start out the show today, Glenn, uh, with your indulgence, talking, I think, about um, the one that's getting more attention, or I think that's has, is going to have a greater impact on American lives, which is um, the crisis with our immigration system. Right. Well, you know, I find it interesting what's going on with the president in general and his administration currently, because it almost appears like, uh, and again, we're going to have very dynamic, our, our whole goal here is to come up with uh, dynamic and unique perspectives on some things, but um, I see uh, a methodology almost in it where if we keep people confused enough, they'll be off balance and they can't center on anything. You know, it's kind of right. like the old adage of, uh, you know, a lion tamer, uh, you know, uh, keeping the lion at bay with a three-legged stool. People laugh at that. Through. Why does he need a three-legged stool? Because the lion can't focus on any one leg, and uh, the lions can't do that. So uh, the, the, I think it's almost a methodology of him coming across with, if I throw enough stuff out there to confuse him, I can get all my other stuff done behind the scenes. But that's probably another show. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Well, what can't be denied is that this is a crisis of our own making. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is the only developed nation in the world that shares a land border with an undeveloped nation. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and that, that there's no nice way to say it. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we actually advertise in these other countries the benefits of coming to America. We right. talk about, you know, we have these welfare programs if you show up, for example. Right. And, and then besides, we, we'll push our laws aside if you show up, too. That's right, exactly right. And you can work here and not pay taxes. Right. Um, and, and take, let's be honest, I mean, take jobs away from the poorest Americans. Right. I mentioned that, by the way, at the outset, because the word I hear over and over again um, is compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we be compassionate uh, what's the compassionate answer? And, and the question that never gets asked is what, what's compassionate for the American worker, right. you know, or the American middle class who has to bear the cost of all of this? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to posit this, Glenn. Um, just throw this out there. I think the prevailing wisdom is that um, this is something the president and the Democrats are doing intentionally mm -hmm. for two primary reasons. The most obvious being they want to get as many of their demographic right. into the country as possible to win elections, mm -hmm. okay? Um, shorter term, I think the president is trying to create an election year issue. They know that um, they're about to lose control of the Senate, that um, more Republicans and Democrats come out to vote in these off-year elections, and I think they're trying 
um, to fundraise off of this. There's certainly evidence of that. Right. And I think they're trying to get Republicans to do something stupid and move, uh, you know, for an impeachment. Because, uh, you know, they saw how when Republicans did it to Bill Clinton, um, the Democrats actually did very well in that next election, right. and actually yeah. won seats in Congress. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the prevailing wisdom. But I'm going to posit this to you and, and I want to get your reaction. I actually think the president has personal reasons for doing this. Mm -hmm. That I think the president feels a greater sense of solidarity with the immigrant community than he does with any um, American community, typically American community. I don't mean that in an immigrant in a pejorative sense. I just right. mean it in the most factual sense possible. And I'll just throw this out there and get your reaction. That the typical immigrant experience uh, sounds something like this. You have somebody who's born hundreds or thousands of miles away from mainland America. Right. They're raised in abject poverty, you know, uh, unpaved streets and no electricity. They're at some point maybe separated from their parents, their mother and father, they're raised with relatives. And they come over here eventually for, you know, later in life, 18 or older, something like that, um, for an education and a shot at the American dream. Right. That's the typical, I think, Latino experience. But it's also our president's background. Mm. You know, and I'm not saying he's not a legitimate citizen. I accept that he was born in Hawaii, 2,500 miles away from California, right. raised in Indonesia, raised again in Hawaii away from his parents before coming here uh, at age 18 to go to college and right. finally meeting America for the first time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something personal. I think he actually feels a greater sense of comedy right. with these people. And so I, I think he sees American rejection of them as a rejection of him. Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting perspective, Jordan, and uh, I think that's the whole point of our show, you know, having these fresh or unique perspectives and hopefully getting some feedback from our audience on this as well. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in a president's mind that I think that uh, a lot of people just don't get, and I think part of that is that whole trek of his life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to think of our president as someone who uh, has uh, Con contiguous relationships or, or experiences with us, uh, that he's a true blue American in the sense of he was raised here, born here, knows the po problems here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, whether that American was born at the lowest uh, of, of poverty level here in the United States or the highest of economic status, we still think of them as someone who's had that full-blown experience of being an American. Uh, and, and you're making a great point that we, number one, we need a leader that we right. would want. I think anybody voting would want to vote for someone who, who is that way. That's why we, you don't, can't be a naturalized citizen and be a, a president, right? Right. So you, you really draw an interesting perspective here that even though by birth certificate president is a citizen of the United States, by experience he's certainly outside the realms of the normal experience that someone would expect a president of the United States to hold, and therefore his mindset and his um, uh, decision-making process uh, is going to be bent in that direction. Uh, add to that, and I'll just add to this, the political motivations of the extreme left. Mm -hmm. And you have a real uh, formula for disaster. And it's just coming to mind that how else could this play out when you think about putting those two uh, you know, volatile scenarios together, you're going to end right. up with an explosion, which is where we're at today. And it, admittedly, it is hard not to notice Democrats at all levels salivating at the prospect of 11 million or 12 million new eligible voters, right? Right, right of course. Um, but I, I think it's, it's something more than that, because it, there is sort of a self-righteous aspect to it, okay? And the problem with, with self-righteousness is that once you've convinced yourself that you're on the side of that which is morally good, you don't feel as obligated to answer the tough questions. You just mm -hmm. simply say, "This Great is point. this is we're on the side of righteousness. Um, this is what should happen. Humanity demands it. Therefore, whatever the costs are, we're not even going to acknowledge that there are costs." Right. And I will tell you this: that I'm a person who believes we should come to an immigration compromise in America. I'll mm -hmm. tell you what mine is. I would say we have 12 million people here. Let them all apply for permanent residency. It's it, you're not going to be able to deport them. I think. It would be kind of cruel to do so, especially considering how long so many of them have been here. So instead of making them go back to Mexico or wherever to start the immigration process, let them start the process here. That doesn't mean everybody gets to stay. That means you get to start the process and live by the results just like everybody else does. Right. Um, the reason we don't reach that is because I think the left, well, first of all, the right doesn't want any kind of compromise, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And the left is refusing to answer the tough questions. Um, 
how will poor Americans compete for job for jobs with this surplus of uh, let's be honest unskilled and largely uneducated labor how much will this cost the American middle class as far as you know tax dollars go and 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 the effect on infrastructure you need you know new schools and right. you know we're we're now being asked to absorb a population that's twice the size of Ireland. Mm -hmm. it, we're, it's not even immigration. It's almost like we're annexing a whole new country here. Right. Um, but we don't get the property or resources to go with it. <laughs> yeah, precisely right. Um, it, you know, and what about the you know the uglier aspects of this? You know, how many of the people coming over do we really know? How many have criminal records? How many of them have sicknesses that we need to you know quarantine out? Quarantine out. Um, and I think it is fair to ask about the political consequences. How will this change the American body politic? Um, a hundred years ago, Glenn, we didn't need to ask these questions because we didn't have a giant welfare state, number one, that, right. that provided for everyone that came over. And also, we had a demand, since we were in the middle of an industrial revolution, um, for more labor. Right. America today is not the America that my great-grandfather came to in 1912 when he showed up in Ellis Island not speaking English. Right. It's something where we, we take it upon ourselves to provide for all these people, not just in terms of welfare, but in terms of jobs and education. Mm. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves if we can really do that and how well we're really doing it for the people who are already here. Well, you know, uh, you pose a number of questions here, and we're coming up on a break, so we're going to have to continue this conversation after the break. But I'd also like to, to throw out one other thought that I think we'll pick up on right after this break, and that is, you know, you have all these Latinos coming into the country from South America, whether Latinos or not is irrelevant. The point is they come from a whole different cultural bent. Right. And it's almost taking what has been developed as America today, American mindset, American um, uh, dream, for lack of a better term, uh, and the American direction, and flooding it with the mindset of third world countries. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like taking uh, what we're doing today and now totally shifting our direction because of the constituency that could possibly be legitimated and legalized and all of a sudden you got this swing in a whole new direction which what does that do? Do we want to be a third world country? Of course not. I don't think, maybe our president wants us to be, but I don't think we want to be a third world country but yet we're bringing in all these third world people with third world perspective into our country and then somebody's even dabbling with the thought of giving them the vote. On that note, we need to wrap up for this segment and uh, we'll come back right after the break with more of this topic.